Okay, I have some great news, and it's this. It's that you and I can evolve. You and I can change. If there's something in your life and my, my life that's no longer working, we can change it. We can move away from it. You can change your politics if you don't want to keep the same politics anymore. You can change your beliefs if you don't want to keep the same beliefs. Yeah, that is what I used to believe, but I don't believe that anymore. You can change that. You can even change your spirituality. You can even change your Christianity. You can. Now, let me give you a little heads up. If you do then choose to change, especially your Christianity, uh, there's going to be a whole group of people that come out of the word, woodwork and say, no, you can't. You can't. It's the same today as it was yesterday, and we need to protect that it stays that way for tomorrow. At least for me, though, I, I just don't, I don't think that's intellectually or historically honest. Christianity has always changed, always evolved. That's its wonder, is that it does change and evolve, and you can change with it if there's something that wasn't, isn't working for you. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, but first I want to say welcome to Sparrow Day Online. I am David Perez, and I'm the lead minister of a pretty new church here in Nashville called Sparrow Day. And uh, it's, a, it's a church that wants to rethink, reimagine Christianity for the 21st century. It wants to evolve, be part of evolving uh, Christianity. So if you're part of Sparrow Day Nashville, I miss you and I hope we see each other soon. I really do. I really miss seeing you and I'm thankful for those moments that we find each other through Zoom and connect that way. I also want to welcome you that as this is now our seventh week online, uh, some of you are somewhere in this country and you've heard about Sparrow Day, this new kind of church that's talking about and reimagining Christianity in a new kind of way. And so I want to welcome you. What's amazing is our online audience has quadrupled from our uh, local audience. So I'm glad this is meaningful to you and I want to welcome you. Well, I want to talk this morning about imagining and really taking our life to a freer and, and more wide open uh, place in this whole idea that uh, you have the permission to change yourself, change your beliefs uh, about life and even faith. So there's, there's this word I want to introduce you to, and um, it's a Hebrew word, and the word is mitz, mitzrayim. That's the word, Mitzrayim. Now, let me show it to you. Take a look. Okay, that's how you spell it. But you pronounce it Mitzrayim. So just to double check, I checked with uh, my good friend, uh, Flip Rice, who is, uh, he's a rabbi here, but he's one of my greatest friends. Flip and I gather every few weeks. We have uh, breakfast together and talk. And uh, well, we haven't in this whole COVID-19 time, but Flip and I did have a Zoom cocktail meeting last week, which was wonderful. But I checked with Flip on the uh, pronunciation, and yes, it's meets Rayim. Okay, this word has several meanings. One, it's a person. Uh, if you probably remember uh, Noah and his big ark, well, he had a grandson and his name was Mitzrayim. Now, what does that have to do with you and me? Absolutely nothing. But the second definition just might mean something to you and me. The second thing Mitzrayim means is Egypt or the land of Egypt. And so, uh, if you're ever reading the Old Testament and you come across the English word Egypt in Hebrew, it would say Mitzrayim, okay? Now, what Mitzrayim means or Egypt means, it, it means uh, a, a very narrow place. It means like a strait. Uh, it means a peninsula. Sometimes Mitzrayim means bondage or blockage. And so... Um, if a Jewish person, uh, reflecting on the deep meaning of their faith, they would know what 
Mitzrayim means to them, not just in place or definition, but in the sense of the nuances for their life. So one of the things I said Mitzrayim means is it means a narrow place. Well, when Moses went down to Mitzrayim, went down to Egypt, and he faced off with Pharaoh and said, listen, you've got to let my people go. They're meant to be free. They need to leave this place. That's exactly what happened. They left the narrow place that had been in their life. They had left this place of blockage, this place of constriction. And so one of the ways we internalize, or this becomes deeper in our spiritual life, is Mitzrayim is this chance to reflect on, okay, just what are the narrow places in my life? And so let me show you this uh, verse from Exodus that will give some nuance to uh, this word and, and especially about when it means a narrow place. And this is from Exodus 16 and Moses is leading the people out of Mitzrayim, Egypt, and through the desert. Follow along here. Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elim and journeyed into the wilderness between Elam and Mount Sinai, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. There the whole community complained about Moses. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. And so I know this whole COVID-19 time sort of feels like uh, we're in a wilderness and we sort of long for the old life. But when we start to take Mitzrayim to heart, what it means is, okay, what are those narrow places in my life uh, that I need to leave? Now, what's a narrow place? Sometimes a narrow place is a place of comfort, right? It's not necessarily good for you. Whenever we're in a comfortable place, we're not being challenged, we're not being stretched, right? We're not developing or not growing. Oh, it's comfortable, but it's not deepening our life. Have you kind of settled in some places of comfort? And that's been sort of a welcome thing, part of this COVID-19. It has sort of uh, rocked us out of those places of comfort. Another thing, uh, a, a narrow place is, it's a place of constriction, right? I remember about 10 years ago, I just came to this place where I knew I was in this narrow place in my life. I just felt constricted in every way. I knew, I knew there were some patterns in my life that were constricting me. I knew I, did, I had uh, been doing some therapy and I was addressing some things from my childhood that had well traveled into my adult life that, that were just adding to the unhealth of my life and I just came to this place where I go, I have got to leave these narrow places. But when I came to that realization here and then here, I gotta be honest with you, I was frightened. I liked my places of comfort. I did not look forward to wandering in the desert of my life. But I just knew, man, if I stay here in my meets Raim, there's no life for me here. So one of the things I'd love for you to do this week is to really reflect um, inwardly. What are those narrow places? What are those comfortable places? What are those constricting places that I just know there's no life for me here? Now, the second thing meets Raim means is, remember I said Egypt? Now, for ev every Jew that really understood this then. And of course, even now, we just celebrated it with Passover. Mitzrayim, Egypt, it, what it represents to the Jew is the place that they were enslaved for 400 years, where Moses goes, we've got to get out of here. There is no life for us here. This is bondage. We've got to move our life towards freedom. And so they moved out. So one of the things Mitzrayim can mean is for us to go, okay, 
there might be some places of enslavement in my life that I've just got to let go. And so what are those? You know, when we really reflect in, um, those can awaken. You know, one of the things that happened to the people as they moved out into the desert and they started to wander and they were in this desert wandering place is they at first had a very external focus. Man, there's nothing to eat here. Life was better back in Egypt. We just wish God killed us there. And there's no doubt that when we are in a tough place, there's the focus on the external. I think of this pandemic time, and that partly is the job of the news and the medical experts to help us focus on the external. Okay, we need this, we face this, we've got to get this. Uh, this is what's real about our environment, right? But what the job of deep spirituality is, is to take us inwardly. When the people were focused on the external, they were in a blame mode. They were missing this chance to grow and to evolve and change. And what this pandemic time can be is for us to get really focused on, okay, are there some things in my life that are enslaving me? Are there some patterns from childhood? Are there certain ways I react to insecurities, fear, ego, esteem? Uh, that just aren't healthy, that are hurting me, that are damaging others. And so I would love for you also to reflect this week, are there some things that are just enslaving me? <clears throat> now, before I close, I want to turn this uh, conversation in light of what we're having uh, with Christianity. And remember a moment ago when I started this, I said, hey folks, we can evolve, we can change. We can change our beliefs. We can change a version of Christianity that we had that's no longer working for us. I don't know how this happened, but somehow at the end of the 20th century, more and more people were waking up to this idea of what happened to this Christian faith that was very meaningful to me, this, this faith of faith, hope, and love, and acceptance, and forgiveness, and inclusion? What's happened to it? It's, it's been hijacked. It's been hijacked, and it's, it's become uh, just a belief system. It's become a doctrine I need to proclaim. Uh, it's become a set of morals that I need to keep a standard to. It's become a top 40 soundtrack that I need to worship to. It's become a whole lexicon and language I need to speak a certain way. And it's become a whole partisan thing that I need to vote by. And for more and more people, and I was one of them, I started to go, what has happened to this faith of love and hope that I have? It, it's become this system, this ideology that now seems narrow. It seems constricting. It's enslaving me. And I just came to this point and it was really sort of freaky. I go, I gotta leave this. Well, where are you headed, David? I have no clue. But this place is narrow and it's constricting and it's enslaving me. And so, folks, as Christianity begins its third millennium, there are a group of us more and more that are going, I don't want this meaningful faith to just become an ideology, an ism in the sea of other isms and other ideologies that I either got to proclaim or defend or make arguments for. And so, you know, when faith, when faith becomes, when, when it's no longer Christianity, it's Christianism or Christian ideology, when it's about uh, Christian exceptionalism, our way is the right way, the way, and we have to dominate that message when it becomes, when we start to crawl in bed with the empire uh, to be the most popular form of faith, 
This is how it becomes an ideology. It starts to divide people. It starts to make teams. Here's the right team. Here's the wrong team. Here are the right team colors. These are the wrong team colors. And as I read the New Testament, as I read about Christianity being the anthem of faith, hope, and love, Christ-like love, Jesus brought a universal message of inclusion, resurrection everywhere everywhere and so i i just had to leave that that narrow place and um and you know there's a word for it when, when faith becomes like that there's a word for it in the old testament it's a tough word and the word for it in the old testament when faith becomes about credos and creeds and doctrine who's in who's out what's right or wrong the old testament word for it is idolatry i've been telling you that they left mitzrayim and are headed to modern day israel the land of milk and honey what will be their spiritual and actual liberation the first law the first command was put nothing set have no other thing before your affection for god that that connection that attachment to god so when we put a certain version of the Bible, our version of the Bible before God, when we put our certain beliefs or doctrine before God or our formulaic ways of belief or salvation, at least for me, and you don't have to agree with me, but for me, it, it had become an idol. My beliefs were more important than my trust and love. And I go, I, I got to leave this. I, there's nothing good about this for me. Now, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. There's nobody to blame uh, for this. And no, it just it's human nature to do this. And so I guess what I want to leave you with is, is how I started. Mitzrayim means to leave the narrow places in our life. Mitzrayim means to let go of the things that enslave us. And, uh, and if your faith or your Christianity, the version of it you grew up with or that you've had, if it's not working for you, you are not leaving Christianity. You are not leaving God. You are leaving somebody's version of it, and that's okay. Now, does it mean you might head out into a desert and wander a bit? I did, but you're going to be okay. God is there. And having, having journeyed at this for 10 plus years, you make it through those deserts. In fact, those deserts and those struggles, as I said a couple weeks ago at Easter, the very things that you think are going to destroy your life or leave you in the desert, those are the very things that transform you and leave you to that, lead you to that place of liberation. So it's okay to leave those narrow places. It's okay to leave those things, to let go of those things that enslave you. There's no life for you in Mitzrayim. It's time to go. So before Lionel and Nicole come to sing, Let's pray about these things. So right where you're at, uh, whether you're sitting on your couch, watching on TV, or looking at your computer, would you, right there, would you bow your head with me? Let's do that. And just begin to breathe slow. Just begin to slow your heart down. Just envelop stillness. And begin to reflect right now. Are there some narrow places in your life that you just know are constricting you? They're just not healthy for you. Oh, they're comfortable. And you're afraid to leave them. But you just know they're not healthy. There's no life there. Are there some things in your life that are enslaving you? Certain patterns, certain habits certain ways of coping or dealing that you just go, ah, oh, this is not bringing freedom to my life. 
Maybe it's time to reflect internal. Maybe it's time to hold on to God, move out into that wilderness, and face and deal with those things in your real life. And just like God was there with them in the desert, even when they didn't think he was, he was leading them to that ultimate place of liberation and freedom where they needed to be. God, I pray that you would be with us. Help us to find the strength to leave those narrow places, to stare down and to move towards those things that enslave us. We need to go into deserts. We need to go through wandering times. This is where the transformation happens. So I pray for folks who just know out there it's time to leave Mitzrayim. It's time to leave it because it's narrow. It's constricting me. It's enslaving me. And I need to move towards faith, hope, love, trust in you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. So as not, uh, Lionel comes and then Nicole sings after, I want you to just really be reflecting on, okay, narrow places, enslaving places, and moving out into wilderness where God is, where life and freedom and liberation awaits. Dare I trust you with my doing with the outcome of my deeds and trust my working as an offering to my neighbor to their need arms out hands open guard down heart free letting go loving true trusting you dare I trust you with my resting dare I slow down and be still in the silence in your presence seeking nothing but your will arms out hands open guard down heart free letting go Loving true, trusting you. I'd like to share a couple of quotes with you from Peter N's book, The Bible Tells Me So, that I think are incredibly insightful about trust, which is always the literal word for faith in the New Testament. Quote, in the spiritual life, the opposite of fear is not courage, but trust. Sweating bullets to line up with the Bible with our exhausting expectations. To make the Bible something it's not meant to be isn't a pious act of faith even if it looks that way on the surface. It's actually a thinly masked fear of losing control and certainty, a mirror of an inner disquiet, a warning signal that deep down we do not really trust God at all. Dare I trust you 
with my being through the mystery of your ways without knowing without seeing as you lead me day by day arms out hands open guard down heart free Letting go, loving true, trusting you. Trusting you. Trusting you.
So I remind my soul that you are always close, no matter where I go. I am not alone. I give up my control to be still. for joining us for our service today. I'm so glad that David talked about this topic. It's really important. I know for me in these last 10 years as I've gone through my own evolving in my faith, I have had to go through leaving behind narrow ways and it has brought me through desert times. For me in particular, the desert times really always include uncertainty, which is just difficult for my personality, but really key for my faith. So I hope that all that was talked about this morning really travels with you uh, through the rest of the week. It's, this is key to what we talk about at Sparrow Day. Well, I do wanna let you know about a couple things that we have coming up this week. First, we are starting a new group called The Artist's Way. So excited about this. It starts this Thursday. It's gonna be led by India Lacerda. So if you're interested in that, you can just go to our homepage on sparrowday.com to sign up for that or to find out more about it. Also, we are gonna partner with the Nashville Food Project, and we are so excited about this. This is a great organization that's in the nation, so right in our part, our neighborhood, and they do amazing work already with food and providing great food for people in need, but they have tremendous needs right now during this COVID-19, and so we'd really like to do our part to help. So we're gonna do this food drive. It starts today, this week. And if you're interested, all you have to do is go to sparrowday.com, go to our homepage, you can find out, click on the little slide that talks about this and you'll get a list of what they're needing. And then you can just drop it off at our office. We're gonna have some receptacles out on our front porch. That way you'll get to see our new office and you'll also get to look over and see the progress that is happening to our church. 
So join us in this effort. We really are excited to help out our city in this way. And then lastly, I just want to let you know that it means a lot to us uh, when you give and help our church. And so if you want to financially give to us, all you have to do is go to spareday.com. You can hit just give here up at the top. It's safe, it's secure, and it is literally helping us to run this church. So thank you, and we'll see you next week.